All right, so we'll continue uh, lecture number 10, Fixed Income Securities, and now we begin with chapter 4, Price Volatility, hopefully for the next, uh, next two sections. The first one is just a simple basic review of the price yield relationship. So one is price yield relationship. And it's very simple. Price yield relationship is negative. And we'll put the textbook here. You can see on page 60 now, zoom in real well. On page 60, on the left at the top, you can watch if you like my finger. You all have uh, the textbook. It's amazingly simple. A bond will have, and you can zoom in further, at maximum price. So you can read very well maximum price. On the vertical, you got a price. And on the horizontal, you got yield. You got a maximum price. Maximum price means if required yield today is zero and you don't discount, you simply add up all coupons and the principal and it gives you the maximum price. The price that will get when the yield or the required rate of return is zero. And then from that point on, the price falls as the yield is rising. This is a pure mathematical relationship which always holds. Okay? Now I can zoom out completely. And we get back to this type of a curve is called And I gave you the explanation of a convex a few lectures ago. Is that the curve has a curvature. And when you connect two points and you draw a straight line between the two points, the curve lies below. Okay. And there are a number of important properties. Now, if we're going to have price yield relationship, convexity, we need to discuss and say simply what is volatility. Volatility is a financial term which simply means variability. Variability. Let's provide a number of examples, uh, high school type examples, so that you can understand. This is case one. Straight line. No variability, no volatility, and therefore no risk. So volatility, volatility is a measure of risk. Now I'm gonna use my finger, a little trick, and draw the next one. I'm going to delete this with a finger and say very little. So this is a volatility of asset A. Now let me draw a bigger volatility. That will be asset B. Now, I draw them like waves, but they don't have to be like waves. You can zigzag, 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 zigzag. Okay? You can have lots of zigzags, okay? And 
you also want to see what's the total variability. So for C is much riskier than B, and B is riskier than A, and A is riskier than the previous one, which was a straight line. Okay. Now here I draw them without a trend, but you can have volatility around the trend. C. It could be very little volatility around an upward trend. It could be a bigger volatility around a similar upward trend. Okay. Or it could be volatility downward around the downward trend and then upward and then downward. In other words, volatility doesn't have to be around the trend at all. Just giving you an example. Obviously, this third one is so much more volatile than the other two. Well, here's another example of volatility. It stays mostly constant and then just collapses. The price stays low, 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 and then just shoots up. Then falls a little, falls a little, falls a lot. Okay? That's just another example of very high volatility. Again, no need to be around the trend. Okay? So basically, it shows you how it varies, okay? And what we want to find out basically is the price volatility of bonds. In other words, is the price of a bond going to vary a lot or very little? Well, you're told that bonds have no risk. Government bonds have no risk. That's not true. Government bonds still have price volatility. And if they have price volatility, then they for sure have risk. They might not have default risk, but default risk is totally different from price risk. So in this particular case, the correct statement to say is that we have volatilities associated with price risk, okay? So very little volatility means low price risk and high volatility means just the measure. So what we have here now, let's see. Okay, what we have here, I'm going back to section one, page 59 at the very bottom is that the price of a bond, that's the bottom paragraph, will depend on the following factors. Number one, perceived credit risk. Now, the explanation is, you guys, how about you just separate, just sit over here for the rest, okay? I mean, you're, <laughs> okay, you're going to take care of your stuff later, whatever it is. Uh, I mean, now is not the time to do consulting, okay? You're going to do it later. Uh, perceived credit risk. Credit risk is exactly the same, it means the same thing as, and I'm going to put an equal sign here, as default risk. Basically, this is the risk of default. The risk that when the time comes, the borrower is unable or unwilling to pay its obligation back, okay? 
nanowoods usually comes because the borrower's earnings have deteriorated. Deteriorate. In other words, they aren't making as much money. If it's government, they are not collecting as much tax revenues to cover their debt obligation. That's number one. Number two, discount or premium. Discount or premium as the bond approaches maturity. Let's explain this. If the bond was sold at a discount, for example, price of 800 when the face value is 1000 as time goes by and you get closer and closer to maturity, the discount will be shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. So discounts always shrink as you approach maturity, assuming that the credit risk has not changed. Okay? So the discount always shrinks as you approach maturity. What about premium? If you've paid 120 premium, of course the premium will also be shrinking as you approach maturity. So as you get closer and closer to maturity, the discount in premium will be moving closer to zero. This basically means if a discount is large, as you approach closer to maturity, the price will move higher, and if the premium is large, the price will be moving lower towards the face value as you approach maturity. So, you will have a natural price fluctuation purely based on the discount or on the premium. You will also have a price fluctuation purely based on the perceived credit risk. As people believe that there is a lower default risk, price of bonds will go up and vice versa. The perfect example is what's going on today with Greece. Well, that was like a year ago. Great bonds will collapse in price and their yields will go up as investors get scared that Greece is going to default. Well, the perceived risk changes as soon as Europe gets together and say, we're going to bail out Greece. So as soon as people think, oh, Europe's going to bail out Greece, suddenly the perceived default risk falls and therefore the price rises. So as people get to see and evaluate the chances of Greece being defaulted, oh, sorry, bailed out or not, the perception changes and the price shoots up and down mostly based on default risk. Now at the same time, discount or premium is huge. The discount in Greek bonds is huge, like 100% return for one year. If it's 100% return for one year, this means that one year bonds sell at a price of 50, face value is 100, and you expect from 50 to 100 to get a 100% return. So the discount in premium is going to be rapidly shrinking because it's only a one-year bond. And on a one-year bond, you got a discount of 50 out of 100. So the 50 is going to shrink rapidly. So a huge fluctuation as credit risk changes, meaning the perception changes. You have a huge fluctuation based on the discount premium. And number three, market interest rates. Market interest rates. Market interest rates sometimes are extremely straight stable. Sometimes the central bank pegs them to the point where they are almost constant. But other times, market interest rates are extremely volatile. In times of financial crisis, they are extremely volatile and usually to the upside. So market interest rates could be moving up, they could be moving down, 
they could be moving up based on fear and perception of crisis or they could be moving down based on perception that the central bank will intervene on the markets and lower interest rates but the point is that market interest rates move entirely based on macroeconomic factors so this is entirely macro it depends on economic growth it depends on inflation it depends on budget deficits okay it depends on possibly tax revenues it depends on a whole set of factors the biggest and most important factor is monetary policy monetary policy as the most important factor in determining market interest rates for the default risk if it's a company depends strictly on the company's capability the corporate corporation's capability to service the debt okay and the maturity of premium is basically the difference between the required yield and the coupon rate okay so these three determine to a great extent the variability meaning price variability or price volatility in a bond okay let's see what we have in section two for today okay section two is uh, characteristics of option free bonds that's page 60. Okay, so some properties are based on convexity. Let's go through property one to property four. Let's see what property one says. Percentage change in the price is not the same as percentage change in interest rate. So, 50 basis points up is not the same as 50 basis points down. Again, that's obvious. I'll be explaining it down the road. So, if you have, let's provide an example, from 2% to 2.1, to 1.9% difference between 2 going up to 2.1 is going to be different than from 2 to 1.9 so just because interest rate moved by in this particular case 10 basis points doesn't mean that the price will move with exactly the same amount of dollars or percentage changes are different and I'm going to be explaining now more oh property number two I can L illustrate as follows for very small very small changes the price of a bond changes similar so if you have 2.00 and 2.00 moves to 2.01 or 1.99 for a tiny little change of only one basis point the change in the price up or down is the same so if the bond here moves from let's say uh, moves plus I don't know 0.3 here it's going to be minus 0.3 so when interest rate it's actually going to be sorry that's going to be the my mistake interest rate going up the price is going down and interest rate going down the price is going up so the change in the price of a bond on the way up is the same as on the way down for tiny little changes okay now what about here well, here, the price is going to be, let's say, uh, minus 1, but here's going to be 1 plus 5. 
So for relatively large changes, you're going to have on the way up, it's going to fall less and it's going to rise more and that should be, let's see what's property three. For line changes, the percentage change is not the same. And now comes property four, which is the key one. Property four. And property four is that for a large change, for a large change, for example, from three going up to four and then going down to 2%, that's a large change, okay? For a large change, the percentage increase is greater than the percentage decrease. So the price from 100 is going to fall to 97. But here, the price from 100 is going to rise to 107. So here, the price drops 3%. Here, the price goes up 7%. So when interest rates fall, the price jumps a lot higher than when interest rate rises, the price falls, okay? That's basically property number four. It's very basic. Many investors love it. They say, oh, if interest rates are now, let's say 5%, if they fall to four, I'm gonna profit more or gain more than if they from five they could rise to six. Well, that's a property out of convexity. Basically, convexity says that as interest rates fall, the price will be rising faster, faster, okay, or quicker. All right? And we move on to characteristics of a bond that affect its price volatility. And there are a number of characteristics. This is fairly basic, but we need to cover it. The first one is coupon. Okay. If coupon increases or if the coupon goes up, volatility goes down. All right, let's try to explain this little piece. So, what does it mean very high coupon? If the coupon is, let's say, very low or zero, this simply means that Everything is discounted at the end. Small changes will discount everything. So let me try to explain the other piece and I'm going to get back to this one. When the term increases, volatility increases. It's, again, this one is very simple and very intuitive. For a one-year bond, if it has certain volatility, two-year bond will have almost double the volatility. Three-year bond is going to have almost triple the volatility. And a 10-year bond is going to have an almost 10 times volatility. And a 30-year bond is going to have an almost 30 times the volatility. It is that simple. So, as you increase the term to maturity, you will increase the volatility. Well, the reason is very simple. If it's a one-year bond, the cash flow is discounted by one plus R. So, as R increases, the price will fall corresponding. But with a 10-year bond, you have one plus R, 
to the power of 10. So for a small change in R, suddenly this to the power of 10 will increase a lot more. And here, if the price falls a little, here the price is going to fall a lot because of the 10th power. It is actually that simple. And now from this term to maturity, the volatility rises, we get about the coupon. And it's very simple. If the coupon is zero, this basically means that the volatility will be very high because it's a zero coupon bond. If the coupon is very high, if the coupon is very high, this means that the first payment, a big chunk of it comes next year. It's going to have a little volatility. The second payment coming after two years is going to have a little bit more volatility. And the last payment coming after five years is going to have a higher volatility. So this means that as the coupon increases, volatility shifts to shorter term and becomes smaller. This is the equivalent of the following. Coupon is, let's say, 10, 10, 10, 1,010 versus 1, 1, 1, 1,001. Here, a big chunk of the payments are coming early on. So this one will have a low volatility. This one will have a low volatility. This one will have a low volatility. And this one will have relatively high volatility. So the volatility here is headed, it is weighted toward the ends. And volatility here is weighted closer to the beginning. So this will mean high volatility because the bulk of the price is determined from the last payment. And here the bulk of the price is determined by the coupons. So this one will have relatively lower volatility and this one relatively volatility. And we have last one, yield to maturity. So if yield to maturity goes up, the volatility goes down. All right, suppose a bond pays 20% relative to 1%. If it pays 20%, this means first year you're going to be getting 20%. Second year you're going to be getting 20%. Third year you're going to be getting 20%. And then you're going to get the principal. Well, this is almost the same as the coupon. Instead of getting 20%, if you're getting only 1%, you get only 1% first year, 1% second year, 1% third year, plus the face value. Obviously, if you have a high yield to maturity, you will have relatively low volatility because the big yield early on will have very little volatility. Remember, one year yield coming after one year is going to be five times less volatile than a five year yield. So, five year maturity has five times more volatility. One year maturity has five times less. So if you have high yield and a lot of the yield is coming early, it will have a very low volatility. High yield means low volatility. And we got basically measures of bond price volatility. So that's section number three. What are the measures? The first measure is price value of a basis point. It simply tells you how much is the price going to change. So this is page 62. How much is the price going to change? Okay. And uh, we just simply have to look at the 
table and try to figure out the table. So let's see if we can zoom in on uh, this uh, table over here. This textbook. Okay, I think I'm going to zoom in on this little table there. And see how I have a five year coupon. straight on 4, 1. So, now you see a five-year coupon gives you a price at 9 and then gives you a price, price at 9, price at 901. So, in the first row you look at 9, in the second row you look at 901. Okay, and now when you have 9, you see the price is 100 for the first one. For the second one is 99.96. And the difference when you subtract them is 0 0.0396. That's the first row, okay? For those of you who have a textbook, it's the first row. So one basis point is from 9 to 901. And you have a change of 0 0.039 for the first one. Now looking at the second bond. Second bond is a 25 year bond with a nine year coupon and it simply tells you with a price of 100, the price falls down to 99.90, 99.90. And the difference is 0 0.098. It's basically almost 0.1. So, you basically see how I have a five year bond, you got a small change, you got a 25 year bond, the change is double, almost triple. Okay? And then you continue. Five year bond at 6%, it shows you 3.0364. You basically compare one by one, and the last column, price value of a basis point, tells you that. If the basis point goes up one, how much in the price is going to go down in the opposite if the basis point goes so if the basis point goes down how much the price is going up and it is as simple as that there's nothing special nothing magic all right can zoom out the second one is called yield value That's fairly simple. We just say, suppose the price changes by one. How much is the yield going to change? All right, so suppose the price falls from 100 to 99. That's the price. And when the price falls from 100 to 99, yield on a bond A for A yield is going to go from 5 to, uh, sorry, my mistake, from 5 to 5.1. 5 and a yield for bond B is going to go from 5 to 5.2. 5 well, now the question is, which of these bonds is more sensitive? Which of these bonds is more price sensitive? So, well, let's try the logic. We'll try to follow here the, the logic. If from 5 to 5.1, it changes for only 0.1 changes 1, here for 2 changes, this means that this is sensitivity here is high and the sensitivity here is low let's explain again slowly if from 5 goes to 5.1 for bond A 
the price drops from 100 to 99. Well, if the price here goes from 5 to 5.1 again, the price drops from 100 to 99 and a half. Let's rewrite it. Let's rewrite it here. So from 5 to 5.1 goes from 100 to 99. Well, here for the same change from 5 to 5.1, only to 5.1, the change is from 100 to 99 and a half. So for 0 0.1, for 10 basis point change, here the price is 1, the price change is 1, and here the price change is 1 half. So this one is highly sensitive, meaning highly volatile, and this one has relatively low volatility. For the same change in interest rate, the price moves a lot less. In other words, the price is less sensitive. So a different way of saying it is that the price risk, or the same in this case as interest rate risk, for B is lower and for A is higher. In this particular example, I constructed it that the price risk is double. The price risk is Double for A relative to B. And then we go with duration. And duration of half prepared turns out the duration is very, 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 very long section, extremely long section. And we don't have much time uh, to, to finish duration today. So next time when we have a lecture, I will focus entirely on duration because duration is the most important measure. It's the most important, it's the most commonly used. At the same time, it's the trickiest and most difficult. So we'll spend one full hour, maybe even two, just focusing and explaining duration in great detail. Okay? And that's coming up next time. Okay, good enough? Any questions?